this woman to this man? I do. And you may claim your bride. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, on this beautiful afternoon, on behalf of the French and Kriker family, I'd like to welcome all of you here this afternoon to witness the wonderful marriage ceremony of Daniel and Carly. May the Lord bless us in this time as we witness this and as we do this in his presence. And for this, let us bow in a moment of prayer and ask his blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have created marriage and you have created for us a specific marriage partner. We thank you that in your time you bring them into our lives, and we thank you that you did bring the paths of Daniel and Carly together. We pray that you would bless them this day and bless us all as we witness this marriage ceremony, and we pray for your sacred presence that uh, we may truly know that we are doing what is pleasing in your sight. We pray keep us from all sin throughout this day and bless us in this ceremony. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to begin by praising our God. And if you would turn in your programs, you'll find the words there to uh, In Christ Alone printed. And we will remain standing at this time to sing all the stanzas of In Christ Alone. Without any further ado, we'll now proceed to the exchange of vows or the uh, institution, purpose, and obligations of marriage, followed by the exchange of vows and the ring ceremony. So as I explained to Dan and Carly yesterday, this uh, part of the marriage ceremony 
uh, is drawn from the Bible and summarizes for us things like where did marriage come from, what is the purpose of marriage, what are our obligations and responsibilities in marriage. And so this is something that uh, they need to listen to very carefully and also for us as married couples, as those perhaps who would like to be married someday, um, let us listen to these words very carefully. Beloved in the Lord, we are assembled here in the presence of God for the purpose of joining in marriage Mr. Daniel Kreiker and Miss Carly French. Since the consistory, that is the elders of the church, have received no lawful objections, we may now proceed to the solemnization of their marriage in the name of the Lord. Therefore, let us reverently call to mind what the Word of God teaches us about marriage. The holy bond of marriage was instituted by God himself at the very beginning of history. He created man in his own image. He supplied him with many blessings and gave him dominion over all things. Moreover, God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We therefore believe that the Lord also today gives husbands and wives to each other. Since they are united by his hand, nothing shall separate them in this life. Our Lord Jesus honored marriage by his blessed presence at the wedding in Cana and confirmed it as an institution of God, as an honorable state, and as a lasting bond when he declared what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Since God has made marriage such a strong bond, he hates divorce. And also our Lord Jesus Christ shows in these words, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Since the, the Lord forbids immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband, so that our bodies may be preserved as a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we may glorify God in our body. The Apostle Paul shows the exalted nature of marriage when he calls it a symbol of the mystical union of the Savior and the Church, his redeemed bride commending it as a state honorable among all. The Word of God also teaches us the purpose of marriage. First, husband and wife shall live together in sincere love and holiness, helping each other faithfully in all things that belong to this life and the life to come. Secondly, by marriage, the human race is to be continued and increased. Thirdly, by marriage, the advancement of the kingdom of God is to be promoted. This purpose calls for loving devotion to each other and a common responsibility for the nurture of children in true knowledge and fear of the Lord, which the Lord may give them as his heritage and as parties to his covenant. For the home which marriage establishes, the Lord ordained that the man should be the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and that he should protect her and provide for her in love, a love which, if exercised in the spirit, and after the example of Christ, will be conducive to mutual happiness. God also ordained that the wife should be subject to the husband in all things that are according to his word, showing him respect even as the church to Christ. Thus, the liberty of both husband and wife is glorified by mutual loyalty to law, and a home so begun in the name of the Lord and regulated by his commandments becomes the very foundation of a Christian society and affords a foretaste of the eternal home. Marriage, then, is a divine ordinance intended to be a source of happiness to man, an institution of the highest significance to the human race, and a symbol of the union of Christ and his church. We may, therefore, as Christians, look with confidence for grace in the discharge of our mutual responsibilities and for guidance and help in our common difficulties and trials. And now, Dan and Carly, having heard from the Word of God the teaching concerning marriage, do you consent thereto 
And do you desire to enter into this holy estate as ordained by God? Daniel, what is your answer? I do. Carly, what is your answer? I do. May the Lord confirm the desire and purpose of your hearts, and your beginning be in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. We'll now proceed to the wedding vows. Daniel, if you would repeat after me. I, Daniel Kreiger. I, Daniel Kreiger. Do solemnly declare. Do solemnly declare. Here before the Lord and these witnesses. Here before the Lord and these witnesses. That I take to myself. That I take to myself. And acknowledge as my wife. And acknowledge as my wife. Carly, here present. Carly, here present. I promise with, with the gracious help of God. I promise with the gracious help of God. To love and guide her faithfully. To love and guide her faithfully. To maintain her. To maintain her. And to live with her in holiness. And to live with her in holiness. According to the Holy Gospel. According to the Holy Gospel. I promise never to forsake her. I promise never to forsake her. But to be true to her always. But to be true to her always. In good days and bad. In good days and bad. In riches and in poverty. In riches and in poverty. In health and sickness. In health and sickness. For as long as we both shall live. For as long as we both shall live. And Carly, please repeat after me. I, Carly French. I, Carly French. Do solemnly declare. Do solemnly declare. Here before the Lord and these witnesses. Here before the Lord and these witnesses. That I take to myself. That I take to myself. And acknowledge as my husband. And acknowledge as my husband. Daniel, here present. Daniel, here present. I promise with the gracious help of God. I promise with the gracious help of God. To love and obey him. To love and obey him. To assist him. To assist him. And to live with him in holiness. And to live with him in holiness. According to the holy gospel. According to the holy gospel. I promise never to forsake him. I promise never to forsake him. But to be true to him always. But to be true to him always. In good days and bad. In good days and bad. In riches and poverty. In riches and poverty. In health and sickness. In health and sickness. For as long as we both shall live. For as long as we both shall live. May we have the ring. Then, placing the ring on Carly's finger, repeat after me. Carly, I give you this ring. Carly, I give you this ring. As a symbol of my constant faithfulness. As a symbol of my constant faithfulness. And abiding love. And abiding love. Yes, Carly, placing the ring on Daniel's finger, repeat after me. Daniel, I give you this ring. Daniel, I give you this ring. As a symbol of my constant faithfulness. <laughs> as a symbol of my constant faithfulness. <laughs> Daniel, I give you this ring. Daniel, I give you this ring. As a symbol of my constant faithfulness. As a symbol of my constant faithfulness. And abiding love. And abiding love. And then without any further ado, in accordance with the laws of the state and the Church of Jesus Christ, I now pronounce you, Daniel and Carly, husband and wife, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. From now on, you go down life's pathway together. And may the Father of all mercies, who of his grace has called you to this holy state of marriage, bind you together in true love and faithfulness and grant you his blessing. Daniel, you may kiss your bride. Now I would ask it that you turn in the blue songbooks in front of you to number 327, and we'll be singing all three stanzas of praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Number 327, let's rise to sing all the stanzas.
now proceed to the um, Unity Sand ceremony. So if you would, this way, I guess you've got to go around, Daniel. Or Most merciful and gracious God, of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named, we ask you to set your seal of approval upon the marriage into which Daniel and Carly have entered this day. We ask that you would give them your fatherly benediction, grant them grace and your Holy Spirit to fulfill with pure and constant affection the vow and covenant made between them. Guide them in the way of righteousness and peace, that loving and serving you with one mind and heart all the days of their lives, they may be abundantly enriched with the tokens of your everlasting favor in Christ Jesus our Lord. In all life's experiences, lift up your countenance upon them, that they may be thankful in prosperity and patient in adversity. May their marriage be fruitful for this life and for the life to come. Grant them wisdom and strength to build a home which shall be to the glory of your name and the coming of your kingdom. May they live together many years, and in the hour of death, may they part in the blessed hope of celebrating forever with all the saints of God, the marriage of Christ and the church he loved. Hear our prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we see this time? Once again, I would ask that you turn in your blue songbooks in front of you to number 36, The Ends of All the Earth Shall Hear. And um, we can remain seated for this one, but we will sing all four stanzas of number 36, The Ends of All the Earth Shall Hear.
for their wedding sermon, Daniel and Carly chose this verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. And it says this in that portion of the Bible, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Honored guests, uh, friends and relatives, brothers and sisters in the Lord, when I was a teenager way back in the 70s, one of the most popular love songs on the radio, and this is going to bring back some memories for those who are middle-agers like me, um, and if your wife gets a wistful look in her eyes, she's probably thinking about some boy she dated back in that time uh, when we were alive back then, when we were young, and we thought that the, the, the world was our oyster. Uh, but the most popular love song in the 70s was a song by the Bee Gees, and it was called How Deep Is Your Love? And the lyrics went something like this at the beginning. I know your eyes in the morning sun. I feel you touch me in the pouring rain. And the moment that you wander far from me, I want to feel you in my arms again. And you come to me on a summer breeze, keep me warm in your love, then you softly leave. And it's me you need to show how deep is your love. It's one of those sappy love songs, and when you hear it now, you think, I can't believe I actually listened to that, but it kind of stays in your head to such an extent that as I began working on this sermon for Dan and Carly, the words of this song, How Deep Is Your Love, came drifting back to me, and I thought I would just incorporate that a little bit. We're here today, of course, to celebrate the love of Daniel and Carly, a love that is so strong and so deep that they have desired to be united in marriage. And, but we know that marriage is not just about today. It's not just about one day, as wonderful as this day may be. Marriage is something that must stand the test of time. Marriage, we know, as any experienced husband and wife here will tell you, marriage is something that takes great work and commitment. If marriage is to last, love must possess a depth that is much more than just physical attraction. And so it's good that Dan and Carly have chosen this verse from the Bible for their wedding sermon. And so we're going to ask the question, not how deep is your love, but how deep is your love to be? And verse 10 tells us, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. And we can sum up what this teaches by saying, True love calls us to absolute dedication to each other and complete self-sacrifice in the service of each other. Now that's far different to what we hear in the love songs way back then and even today, isn't it? True biblical love is not feeling the person you love in a warm summer breeze. It's not the rain reminding you of that person, although I suspect the rain in the future might remind Carly and Dan of this day. Um, but true love is not that. It's commitment to the happiness of that person every day for the rest of your life. True love must be so deep that the needs of your marriage partner take first place over your own needs. We must be devoted to one another. Well, what does it mean to be devoted to someone? To be devoted to someone means that there is nothing and no one in this world that can tear us away from them. We have a loyalty to them that is as strong and as unbendable as steel. In marriage, it means that we love them with the greatest of tenderness and affection. In fact, we hear in this passage in the Bible that we are to be devoted to each other in brotherly love. Now, that sounds almost icky if you don't understand what it means. Sounds, sounds almost incestuous, but it's not. Christians aren't hillbillies who marry their sisters. The Bible seeks to give us, by using this kind of language, the Bible seeks to give us a sense of how deep our love is to be for each other, especially in marriage. Now, you see, in the time that this particular letter was written in the Bible, the official language spoken by everyone was Greek. And so this letter was written in Greek, and the Greek language has or had several words for love. And one of the words is used here. And the words that, that's used here describes the kind of love that parents feel toward their children or that siblings feel toward each other. It describes that uniquely close, unbreakable connection that is the product of being of the same blood. We've all heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. Family love, in other words, is so strong that nothing can destroy it. You try to attack one of her children and mom turns into mother bear on you. Siblings may have their differences in the home, but they will always have each other's backs. Well, the sense here in this passage is that the love we must have for each other 
as Christians is similar to the kind. It can be compared to the kind of love that we have for our own families, even for our own siblings. Our love as fellow Christians must be as deep as the natural love that we have in our families. That's the kind of love that Paul is talking about here, a self-sacrificial love, a Christ-like love, to be exact. We read in Ephesians 5 of the love of Jesus Christ for His church, His bride, that He loves her and gave Himself up for her. That is, He laid down His life on the cross for the sake of the church. Why? To save us from the consequences of our sins so that we might be forgiven and that we might be reconciled to God. That's what we're talking about here. Dan is to be devoted to Carly and Carly to Dan with the same measure of love and loyalty that Christ has for His church, a love that can be compared to the love that exists among family members. That's how deep it's your love must be for your marriage to survive. Well, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, think about what happens when problems arise in families. We don't jump ship. We don't we, um, leave the family altogether. We say our peace. We express our feelings. Maybe some forg forgiveness needs to happen, but we keep moving along together. We're family. We're blood. We're very close to each other. That's the kind of loyalty that we're called to in marriage, the same kind of lo loyalty that we would show to our own families. If you grew up with brothers and sisters in the home, you know how easily fights can break out how annoyed we can get with each other. But if we're in trouble, we know that our brother or our sister is going to be right there with us. They're always going to have our backs. Children may break their parents' hearts sometimes by the choices that they make. There may be some anger involved, some restrictions, some consequences. There might be threats of taking them out of the will. But a parent cannot stop loving their child. Siblings cannot stop loving each other. When one family member hurts, the others hurt. When they rejoice, we rejoice. So strong, Dan and Carly, must your love be. A love that is indestructible. And let's remember that marriage is not an arrangement that suits two people. Marriage is a lifelong relationship. And in relationships, there will be differences and there will be disagreements. And for that relationship to work and grow, for us to put up with the quirks and habits of another human being living in the same house with us day after day, we need a love that is as strong as the one that exists between parents and children and siblings toward each other. And here's the thing. Human beings don't possess that kind of love naturally. We need that love to be supplied to us. And that's where your faith comes in. That kind of love is defined by un that, that kind of love that is defined by unbreakable loyalty is found only in God and in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so it is to Him we must turn every day to enable us to love each other as we ought. This is where regular church attendance comes in, so that we are growing in our love for, for the Lord and in our knowledge of Him. This is where daily Bible reading is important. It's in the Bible that God speaks to us instructing us as to what is good and what is evil, drawing us ever closer to Himself, and changing our hearts so that our hearts become more and more like His heart. This is where daily prayer is important. Through prayer, we speak to our Heavenly Father, together and for each other, asking for the gifts that we need to love our spouse as we are, to be a faithful spouse. In prayer, we confess our failures, in prayer, we thank Him for the one that He has given us. And Dan and Carly, take these things to heart. If you would have a marriage that is characterized by a love that is as deep as the, as the Bible commands, if we are to be, to be devoted to each other in brotherly love, we must be drawing our strength from God. Same goes for the second part of the verse. We're told that we must honor one another above ourselves. What does it mean to honor someone? It means to hold them in high value, to exalt them, to recognize their great worth. Christianity, of course, calls us to a great amount of humbleness, and so our pride and our selfishness must be dying away. And more and more, we see the value in others. We defer to them. We show them respect. 
And Christian marriage calls us especially to see the value of our husband and our wife. Certainly, as we heard in the marriage form, husbands are to be the heads of their home in the sense of being the final decision maker, the one who takes on the brunt of the heavy stress in the home. But their wives at the same time are to be treated with respect And as a fellow heir of eternal life, husbands are commanded to love their wives. Our wives, we have to remember, are not our servants. They are our partners. Their opinion matters. Their feelings matter. We are to love them the way Christ loves his church, with a self-sacrificial love that seeks to make her feel every day as if she is the very center of the universe. In the same way, Carly, you are to honor Dan in his God-ordained role as leader of your home. You are to treat him with respect, not belittling him, that is, putting him down or making light of his calling. You are to encourage him to make decisions and seek his advice in difficult matters in the home. And here's the good part. If you both fulfill your calling to love and respect each other, your home will be characterized by harmony and peace. In fact, the Bible tells us here to honor one another above yourselves. We've talked about this in premarital counseling. We've said that marriage is about change. It's about making sacrifices, always seeking the happiness of our spouse. Here we're told that marriage includes the commitment to put our husband or wife first place in our lives and ourselves second. That's what makes Christian marriage so challenging, by the way, and yet so wonderful if we do it right and if we follow the ways of the Lord. Because no longer are we solely seeking our interests, but we're seeking the interests of our marriage partner, and they're seeking the interests of ours. And here again is something we struggle with as as fallen human beings. By nature, we want to be first, and we want to be the best, if possible. This evening when the buffet opens, let's be honest, we want our tables to be the first, to be called before others. In a checkout line, We want to be in the fastest line possible that's moving. I remember as a child, if a sibling was given a bigger piece of birthday cake than I, well, there would be much weeping and complaining. Even babies will scream out, mine, when another child touches their toy. Why? Because by nature we're selfish. But then Jesus comes to live in our hearts. And Jesus was the most unselfish person who ever walked this earth. Philippians 2 describes Jesus as being in very nature God. That is, he was God himself. He was divine. Yet he humbled himself by becoming a man. He who was Lord of the universe, creator of the universe, humbled himself. The master became a servant. And he did all of this. Why did he do it? To save us from our sins. To die on the cross bearing our punishment upon himself. And when he lives in our hearts, that's when we begin to think less and less of our rights and privileges and that of others. Because we think of Jesus, who committed no sin, and yet took our sins upon himself and suffered and died on the cross. For our sins, he put us first place because he loved us. And when Jesus comes to live in our hearts, then we begin to put others first place and ourselves second If you're here this afternoon, by the way, and you don't understand what Christianity is all about, here it is in a nutshell. Christianity is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was himself God, coming into this world to save sinners. What's a sinner? A sinner is someone who breaks one of God's commandments. uh, You're probably familiar with the Ten Commandments. A sinner is one who breaks the, the Ten Commandments of God every day in thought, word, and deed. That is, he came to save every one of us. And God promises that if we believe in Jesus, our sins will never be held against us because Jesus has taken the punishment for our wrongdoing upon himself already on the cross. But you have to believe in Jesus, and then you can begin to honor others above yourselves as Dan and Carly are called to today. As Christians, Dan and Carly, your goal in marriage must be to praise the other before they praise you, or, or not to look for praise for them, but uh, to uh, seek to praise them instead, to recognize their accomplishments before your own. 
to look to the needs of your spouse before your own. Be the first to say, I'm sorry, to admit wrong. Seek to be a blessing to the other, always. Serve each other. Don't be a taker. Give of yourself. Express appreciation. Show affection. Encourage and comfort. And most importantly, seek the spiritual growth of each other. Because if you both are growing in your faith, you will be a constant and continual blessing to each other. And so, dear brother and sister, may the Lord bless you as you begin your lives together today. Please take seriously the verse that you have chosen and love each other deeply. How deep must your love be? With powerful devotion to each other, a love that is as strong as that which blood relatives have for each other. And honor each other above yourselves. That's what it takes. Don't take each other for granted and think that your lives are going to be perfect just because you're married. Now, Dan is a chicken farmer and a good one. But Dan, I would give you this piece of advice, pun intended. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Put the work that it takes into your marriage. And Carly, Carly is in the field of accounting. Hold yourself accountable at the same time. And both of you, look to the Lord for his help and give to, the, to each other what you owe to them. Amen. Please at this time turn once again in your songbooks to number 408, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We will rise to sing the three stanzas of Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 408. <laughs> 